Hi everyone, um, this is a talk for PKC 2020. Uh, I'll be talking about a new paradigm for public key functional encryptions for degree two polynomials. Uh, first, let me give you some context with an example, filtering encrypted emails. So here, suppose Alice wants to send some confidential email to Bob. Um, Bob will generate a public key that Alice will use to encrypt the email and an associated secret key uh, that will allow Bob to decrypt and recover the content of the email. But Alice doesn't send the encrypted email directly to Bob, but rather to a server. And Bob would like the server to do more than just storing the encrypted email without compromising his privacy. So Bob would downgrade his secret key to produce restricted secret keys that allow the server essentially to get some bit of information on the encrypted emails, but um, uh, doesn't completely recover the entire email. For example, a key that will tell whether an encrypted email is spam or is urgent. So encryption allows to do that. Bob key is called a master secret key and every restricted key is associated with a function and it's called a functional secret key. And a functional secret key associated with a function f will allow the server to recover from an encryption of m the value f evaluated on the message m and nothing else. And it's possible to generate functional secret keys for different functions in a specified uh, class of function. Uh, and each of these key will be different and will yield different partial information. And intuitively, the security guarantee, the security um, notion guarantees intuitively that an adversary that can corrupt arbitrarily many uh, secret keys, functional secret keys, will not learn anything more than what each um, uh, of this key individually, individually allows the users to learn. In particular, it's not possible to combine these keys to, ex uh, to obtain extra information. That comes up is, uh, can we build a practical FE from sound assumptions, even if it is um, for a restricted class of function? And answering uh, first was the work of Abdallah et al, which build a functional encryption for inner products. So in, in that in their case, the message being encrypted is a vector of um, some dimension, call it D, and every functional secret key is associated with a, a function described by a vector Y, which is also of dimension D. And decryption recovers the inner product of X and Y. So that means you can actually compute weighted sum on the encrypted data. Uh, so compute basic statistics. Uh, so this is the first non-trivial FE um, from standard assumption that has practical efficiency from uh, non-trivial functions. And so this gives a fine grain access to the encrypted data as opposed to all or nothing. Um, and it captures already, for instance, NC0 circuit. Later on, uh, Baltico et al. gave the first public key a fee where functional secret keys are associated with degree two polynomials and where the ciphertext remains succinct. That is, their size grows uh, proportionally to the dimension of uh, the vector being encrypted and not quadratically. Uh, that means you can compute more advanced statistics on encrypted data. Uh, it's useful in its own right. It has some implication, for instance, to predicate encryption, uh, trait or tracing. And um, in a work uh, with Theory Fell and all, uh, we build actually a concrete uh, implementation of degree 2 FE, and we use it for private inference on encrypted data. So this thing is practical and it runs. Um, and uh, there's also a theoretical reason why we care about degree 2 FE. And the reason is that uh, it's not far from um, I.O. In fact, uh, by a surprising result uh, from Lean and Tesaro, uh, they show that uh, degree three FE, succinct, uh, implies I.O. 
So the gap is actually smaller than we may have thought at the beginning. Although we still don't know how to build a degree 3 FE. And even later on, uh, Jane, Lin, Matt, Sahai show that you, it suffices to have a degree 2.5. I won't go into details, this is beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, what, what it means, but it's basically a um, degree 2 computation on private uh, input, and there is some public input, and you can compute also on the public input. So this is sufficient for IO, together with a non standard assumption on PRG. So basically, what I'm trying to say is um, uh, functional encryption for low degree polynomials is actually really advanced to FE for richer classes of functions. There's a lot of bootstrapping. So a better understanding of degree 2 FE will uh, most likely shed light on richer classes of function. So in our work, we also build a degree, uh, FE for degree 2 polynomials that has uh, the advantage of being simulation secure under standard assumption. Prior works being either indistinguishability-based selectively secure or rely on generic group model. Um, so let me tell you briefly what uh, indistinguishability-based security is. Uh, it's a game where the adversary gets a public key, then uh, can query a key generation oracle to get functional secret keys for function of her choice. And then at, at some point sends a pair of message to a left-right oracle and gets back the encryption of one of the two messages uh, chosen at random. And the adversary has to guess which message was encrypted. Of course, you need to um, take into account the information that's being leaked by the functional secret keys. Right, The adversary is supposed to learn f of m, v, for all f queried to the key generation oracle. So. Uh, to avoid trivial win, it needs to be the case that for all correct function f, f of m0 is equal to f of m1. This is a natural variant of uh, NCPA uh, securities that we know for public encryption to the setting of functional encryption. People usually settle down for indistinguishability-based security because uh, the stronger notion of simulation security is known to be uh, impossible for some function, for some classes of function. But it's not the case for quadratic function or in the products. And in fact, in, in some cases, um, uh, simulation security is more meaningful. It's closer to the intuition uh, that a functional secret key for the function f reveals nothing else than f of m. Uh, let me explain what um, simulation security is in a simplified setting. So the adversary will choose a message and a bunch of functions. And then it will either receive uh, from a real experiment a public key, an encryption of M, and a bunch of uh, functional secret keys, or a, a fake public key and a fake ciphertext and a, a bunch of fake functional secret keys that are simulated by an ideal experiment that only sees the function F and the outputs F of M. In particular, it doesn't see the message M. And this is computationally indistinguishable. For the adversary, right? So that means basically uh, the uh, ciphertext doesn't convey uh, any information on m beyond f of m. This is stronger than indistinguishability-based security, and um, um, in some setting it's more meaningful, or rather, the indistinguishability-based security is, is meaningless. For example, suppose you want to encrypt a PRG seed, and you generate a functional secret key. For that PRG, then simulation security tells you that uh, you reveal nothing beyond the evaluation of the PRG, which is pseudo random. However, indistinguishability based security gives you pretty much no nothing, no security at all. All right. Um, also, so simulation security is harder to achieve, but also easier to use, especially when using FE as a building block for larger classes of function. Um, I haven't mentioned it so far. There is a adaptive and selective variants of these security notions, where in the selective variant, the adversary is artificially uh, restricted to choose the message and the function beforehand, before receiving anything, a public key or secret keys. Right? Adaptive means it doesn't have such restriction. It can choose the messages based on the keys he has previously seen. Of course, adaptively secure uh, is more desirable. It's a natural notion. Selectively secure is still meaningful and 
it's usually a stepping stone towards adaptive security. And also, uh, you can get adaptive security from selective security, generically, with a guessing argument uh, at the price of a exponential security loss. So the gap between um, this two security notion is quantitative, whereas between these two, it is more qualitative, and these two are actually incomparable. And of course, we would like to have a simulation adaptively secure scheme, which is uh, an interesting open problem. Uh, we go one step forward here by providing the first simulation secure um, uh, FE for degree two polynomials from standard assumptions. So both of these are using uh, standard assumptions on pairings. And another advantage that we have is that we essentially get CCA security for free, right? So CCA uh, stands for chosen ciphertext attack security. It is a de facto security notion for public key encryption. Um, so when you consider general purpose FE, you don't really care because CCA comes for free. Uh, but for restricted class of function, then it makes a difference. Um, and also importantly for FE, the typical transformation such as uh, Fujisako Okamoto uh, doesn't work because uh, <clears throat> it requires a decryption algorithm to recover entirely the message, which is not the case in FE. So uh, it is not useful here. And um, the CHK transform also doesn't help. Uh, it helps for ABE. Um, so you get actually CCA security for free, but not for uh, restricted class uh, FE. Um, you can always use the now young transform, but it requires the extra assumption of NIZK. Uh, you can do NIZK from pairing, but still it's relatively heavy because you need to do NIZK for uh, potentially complicated NP language. Uh, what we do instead is use a um, very efficient um, quasi-adaptive NICK for a specific language, a linear language uh, from Kiltsui, and <clears throat> that's just two group elements. So that's really a little computational overhead. So to be honest, um, <clears throat> this is not technically challenging to get that. <clears throat> But that's not the point. The point is to <clears throat> um, show the advantage of having a simpler scheme. It's more efficient and you get features for free, essentially. But the most uh, important technical novelty and uh, uh, contribution here is uh, the proof and the new techniques that we'll see. Uh, okay. So I'll first give an overview of the scheme, then uh, give a simpler scheme that's only private key and finally, show how to upgrade it to the public key setting. The general overview is that to encrypt a vector x of dimension d, you'll be using a what's called a bilinear maps or pairing, that's the same thing, uh, which maps group elements from a group G1 and with elements from G2 into a target group. So these groups are cyclic generated respectively by little g1, little g2. And for any exponent a and b, pairing this guy with this guy gives that guy. So that means you can compute uh, one multiplication in the exponent. And this is going to be particularly useful for us because we want to compute degree two polynomials in the exponent. So uh, equipped with this bilinear maps, we'll be giving an encryption of x in G1, so a bunch of group elements, and another encryption in G2. And with this map, we can pair together these group elements depending on a particular function f to get another encryption in the target group of the, met the method we care about, x times f times x, which is the evaluation of the degree two functions on x under some particular public key that will depend on f. So there is some key homomorphism going on here. And the functional secret key will be the secret key that's associated with that particular public key. And this secret key will be tied to f so that it only is useful for an encryption under pk sub f. And it will reveal x times f times x, All right? will not be useful otherwise. Okay. That is what we want to build. And in fact, prior works use that um, blueprint, Baltico et al, 
Um, the difference with our work is that we are going to use different encryption, ENC1, ENC2, and ENC2. In their work, they use 30 structured encryption, ENC1, and ENC2. For those who know, they use implicitly a function hiding in our product FE. You can think of it this way. And uh, as a result, there's encryption ENC-T that is fairly simple. You can think of it as Elgamal, actually, in GT. In our work, this is kind of the opposite. We take very simple ENC-1 and ENC-2, which uh, consequently give a simpler um, scheme and shorter ciphertext. And to compensate for that, we'll have to use a slightly more complicated, more structured encryption ENC-T. But that is okay. I mean, the point is here to have a shorter ciphertext. Uh, the ciphertext only contains ENC1 and ENC2. It doesn't contain ENC-T, which is only computed during decryption. As a drawback, we'll have a more complicated functional secret key. But this is really not the thing we're trying to optimize. We are trying to optimize a ciphertext size because actually functional secret keys can be reused many times. Um, all right, so now what do I mean by simple? I mean almost as simple as Algamal, which is like the natural options that come to mind when uh, talking about cyclic groups. So slightly more structured than Algamal, but not much more. All right. And just to confuse you a little bit, I'll switch and use additive notations. Um, all right. Okay. So let's go now in, into more detail. Um, so first I'm going to give you a private key FE. This is not really what we aim for, but that's a good uh, stepping stone. So how does it look like? As I said, like the first thing that comes to mind is using Algamal, so we'll do that. Uh, so you want Algamal encrypt X. So what is um, the public key? It's just a, a vector of group elements, and the secret key is the exponents. All right, so sample a random R, and this is your encryption. And do the same thing in G2. All right, for a different public key B and different randomness S. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just uh, pair this vector in, uh, with this vector, brutally, what do you get? You get X times F times X. This is a message you care about, plus some extra terms. Um, I could have written it out, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that this extra terms happens to um, be computable from an inner product of a vector of a uh, dimension that is proportional to d, all right, and not d square, which only depends on the input x and the randomness r and s, all right. All of this is known by the person that encrypts. So in fact, that person can compute this vector. And the fact that the vector is short means the scheme has a chance to be succinct. Right, so now we need to find a mechanism to essentially recover this extra term to decrypt. This uh, in a product is between this vector and another vector of same dimension, which only depends on the secret key and the function f. So this uh, can be computed by the key generation, the, the algorithm that generates functional secret keys. Um, all right. So what is the idea to recover this extract term and decrypt the, this value? We will be giving um, an encryption of this, oops, uh, yeah, of this guy under inner product FE. So uh, functional encryption that handles, that can, you know, uh, allow computation of uh, inner products. And uh, so this will be part of the ciphertext. And that will be the functional secret key associated with the function f. So uh, by the correctness of the inner product of a scheme, this key, well, this, this uh, ciphertext will recover the extra terms, which exactly gives out x times f times x. That's great, but um, there is um, an issue here. So OK, inner product f will hide this vector. That's great. We want to hide the randomness in order to argue security of the algamal encryption. And we also want to add x, for that matter. So this is hidden. But this is actually not hidden. Functional encryption doesn't hide the function, unless you use a function hiding that exists. In fact, we can that's known 
foina product from pairing so that's great um and then we'll hide the, the secret key and it's of course it's important to hide the secret key otherwise you would basically break uh, el gamal you would completely destroy the security um so yeah it seems to work but there's there's an issue with that um the issue is essentially there is no such thing as um a public key function hiding in a product uh, why it has to be private key it's uh, inherent restriction and um why so uh, suppose you have a function hiding in a product fe so what does that mean uh, I, I told you bif briefly but it means if you encrypt a vector x and you generate a key for a vector y you will hide x and y up to uh, revealing this value x times y in a product of x and y and nothing else is revealed right essentially um, but if it's a pu public key encryption scheme, then you can, uh, everybody can compute ciphertext for any X. Uh, so you will recover X times Y for any X of your choice. And that means you can recover entirely Y. There is no function hiding here. Right. So the scheme has to be private key for, um, if, if, if we want to achieve any meaningful, uh, function hiding. And in fact, this is the reason prior works, uh, such as uh, uh, the work by uh, Rachel Lin uh, and um, Anand and Tahai, uh, this is the reason they, their scheme is private key, because they use function hiding in a product FE. So the main technical challenge we solve is how do we get around this? Uh, how do we make the scheme public key? So the idea is. <clears throat> um, We'll use some function hiding, but not completely. Our scheme will actually be partially hiding the functions. And this is possible because we only care about generating ciphertext for vectors that lie in a span of a particular matrix M. That means uh, a public key will automatically uh, reveal M times Y. This is necessary, but nothing else beyond that information. All right. And um, this is the, the, the part that uh, of why that is hidden will be sufficient to hide these extra terms and to hide the message. That will be sufficient for, uh, for us to prove security on the overall scheme. And the reason we can afford to only generate inner product FE encryption for vectors that lie in some specific span is because we use slightly more structures than LGML. We use actually down guard LGML tiny bit more structure, but still much uh, less complicated than what was used before. And um, that implies that the vector has a special structure that we can exploit to bypass the uh, impossibility result of a public key function hiding. So we have seen um, a scheme that is simulation secure under standard assumption uh, for um, degree two polynomials, and it's even CCA secure almost for free. Natural question that comes up is, can we get actually adaptive security? More generally, um, it would be interesting to study in the class of function that can be uh, built from standard assumption and um, thereby narrowing this gap and understanding w exactly wh what separates us from a, a, a full-fledged FE. Um, for example, mm, uh, it would be interesting to build uh, FE for degree two polynomials for large messages. All right, so um, I didn't mention that, but the schemes, uh, the prior schemes and uh, our scheme all share this feature that the message is recovered in the exponent of a group elements, so you need to brute force the discrete logarithm, and that restricts uh, the, the scheme to small message. It would be interesting to get loud message. It would be interesting in its own right, and it's all, also have it's likely to have implications for larger uh, classes of functions. For example, lattice-based scheme would be a good candidate, although there is some partial negative result on that. Um, Akin Unal showed that function hiding in a product FE from lattices um, can be um, subject to generic attacks, uh, like a, a large class of schemes. All right, but still, there's a, a, a lot of things to explore in this area.
concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.